Keep people. <laughs> oh, Apple, you never disappoint. They've got the new Mac Pro. They got this really gorgeous display, and it swivels, you know, portrait mode, all this, mm -hmm. and everything's expensive. And then, like the stand, the stand for the display, one thousand dollars. What? Wow. Well, because the display itself is like five grand, right? Yeah, I was mean, like, why not? Thousand dollar stand? Why not? <laughs> the death of iTunes. iTunes is now yep. being split into Apple Music, Apple Podcasts, and Apple TV apps. I think that's a good map. idea. Yeah, I mean, it is. five years too late. I wonder what that means for the iTunes video store and the bookstore. Well, no, iBooks is probably an iBooks. Yeah, I think that they, they would just yeah. all get their own market tab, right? Maybe, but then that defeats the point of... Why would I go to music for books? <laughs> right. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they'll just make more Mac apps for each of those different things too. So, I would guess. I mean, oh, I guess Apple TV. No, Apple TV makes sense though, that the video stuff would be in there. Duh. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Not like they ever took books seriously. So. No. Yo, 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 hey. yo. Oh, I don't know what I mean. So I started that game. Oh yeah. How far did you get in it? Um. Like maybe ten minutes. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> but like the thing is, uh, the the very good thing is about thirty minutes into it. That I I, I I suspected that much, but like the kids were all gathered around, and it's like I didn't want to go on without them. I I, I didn't want. Oh, to you're say, playing it with them. Well, I mean, I started it, and they were immediately enchanted. There's yeah. something about this sleepy, um, I little, don't know, little, little village. Yeah, sleepy little village, and 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 well wishers, and sure. you could clearly tell that you're begin beginning a journey, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and the kids were really into it. They wanted to, well, let me try practicing the Lunar Lander or whatever, uh, you know, yeah, and yeah. then- All and the then, tutorial stuff. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, either I'm gonna have this as a solo experience or I'm gonna bring them along for the ride. And it felt like I should wait. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just letting you know, man. Gets you heavy. Got, you got it. Well, you, well, well, you got to get over the hump. Or not even the hump, but you got to get over. You got to crest the hill. I mean, I I, I love good stuff. Everything I saw. Great. I, I oh, think it's all looked great. No, okay. Stop trashing it, Brian. Stop <laughs> no, it. No. <laughs> Hashtag it gets better. Oh my god. <laughs> Hi everybody. We're gonna do weird things here. Yeah. In just a few moments. How's everybody doing on a Monday? Oh my goodness. It feels as though I've already done three podcasts. I'm already. I'm so excited for be with be with everybody, man. I missed everybody so much. I just like talking with you guys, and I'm I'm just very excited. I'm very excited to be back. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're great. It's good to see you too. What what's on the live blog now? Uh, I you know I'm watching The Verge, and their 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 coverage is a little bit too snarky for me. Well, it's that Nilai flavor, baby. It's that Nilai. Not to say that there's not room to make fun of a thousand dollar TV stand. <laughs> All righty. Well, uh, I think I'm good to go here on my side. I got my recordings viewing. Thank you, everybody who uh, uh, put up with us for doing banked episodes the past couple of weeks. But we're live, baby. We're back. We're live. Yeah, man. Our our Game of Thrones uh, predictions, man, it's turned out really wrong. <laughs> Well, that would have been ours. funny if we went off and did like you know just assumed certain stuff, you know. <laughs> well, but Brian on on spoiler in time over at courtkillers dot com. I made a, a shockingly a, uh, uh, correct, call. pretty close. Yeah, a good a a, 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 a bang on prediction. Nice, yeah. nice. Yeah, I wound up catching like a bunch of spoilers before uh, before. Like, I guess after the last episode, the second to last episode, there was like some dude who posted like somewhere a while ago, like just basically all the spoilers, like a list of spoilers that would happen during the season. And specifically by the second to last episode, when all of them had come true and there were just like four, the four <clears throat> things that would happen in the finale. And I'm like, oh, OK, well, I guess all this happens. And lo and behold. Oh, Ooh. that sucks. 
I mean, it's to be honest, it's not stuff that you couldn't kind of guess by where everything had sort of laid out yeah. uh, prior to that. But uh, yeah, man. I mean, whatever. Game of Thrones. Remember when we all were yelling about Game of Thrones? Well, now we're here. Yeah. I mean, I spoiler um, the ending already on the ship. You know, like I want to watch that show now. I want to watch the show about the young Starks trying to rule and explore. Yes, I, I mean, my my large take on seasons seven and eight is like I don't really have a problem with any of those episodes. I wish that there were episodes in the middle of them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because that's what I think is is in the DNA of that show was a lot of you know, uh, uh, anticipating movements and, and pressure building. And there was pressure, precious little of that in the final two seasons, which uh, as much as everybody is like dunked on Benioff and Weiss, like I, I really don't know what goes into, I, I, I guess I am not as comfortable saying, no, oh, they wanted to do Star Wars. So they did shorter season <laughs> uh, compared to like, hey, look, that's really hard to do. It's really expensive when all that cast is now getting, more and more famous and are doing more and more projects and scheduling things probably aren't as easy as it was in, in the first couple of uh, seasons. So I don't know. I would have loved more episodes. It would have been great, but uh, who knows what goes into putting a show like that together. Yeah. All right. You guys ready to do weird things? Let's yep. Go. All right. Then take it away, Andrew. In three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Justin Robert Young. Oh yeah, baby, we're back! And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello, I'm happy to be back in normal time, in the normal flow of time. The space-time yes. continuing has been smoothed out. We are now back well, in space. Tell you what, in the re-entry, you got a smart new haircut, Bryce. Oh, no, Jeez. Thank you. Looks like, good. I've been doing I've been doing a reverse growing it out every every week or so. I've been cutting another inch or so off. <laughs> but it, it's you don't you don't get to tell. It's certainly not in the audio version of this podcast. You can't really tell very much. Well, just imagine a real smart haircut. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And then please draw it on uh, whatever you have. Just think of whatever <laughs> is in your head, and then just send it exactly. to uh, 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 what, what are you on Twitter at Brackus. Yeah, B R Y C A S. <laughs> yes, and your, what you imagine Bryce's haircut to look like. It's kind of like he just passed that Gary Oldman Fifth Element phase. <laughs> yeah, it's back. It's back to the Gary Oldman level, for yeah. sure, for sure. <laughs> so, uh, gentlemen, um, while we were scattered to the four winds, some interesting things happened. SpaceX launched, I think, last week. They're Starlink, the first group of 60 Starlink satellites. These are part of their plan. They want to be able to provide global internet around the world, ultimately with thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit with really low latency, which would maybe even allow you to connect faster than fiber optic. It's part of their plan for one of the big ways of earning revenue for SpaceX. So they did their first test launch of 60 satellites and they launched in what was they called kind of like a, a kind of a star train because they, they all came out of one one launcher, and they start to spread out, and it was a very beautiful sight to behold as these things started to unfold. And they have kind of is typical SpaceX their own design. Instead of the classic two solar panels, they each have one solar panel. They're using uh, you know ion thrusters with krypton gas to help them reach their altitude, and it was a, a beautiful launch. You know, incredible technology. As all things must, not without controversy. Um, once these satellites went up, 60 of them in a row, when they're bundled together, as they head towards the horizon, you could see a very bright flare, and you could spot this. And astronomers are now going like, what's going to happen when we have thousands of these satellites up there? Now, it should be said that when they first start reaching orbit, they're clustered together, and they're easier to spot. And when they're finally spread out, they'll be harder to see, but not impossible. And now there's the concern of what happens with thousands of these things up in space. I mean, the, the answer is fairly transparent, right? We, we move the telescopes outside of low Earth orbit, right? Well, it's imagine you're, not, you're an amateur astronomer. You're a backyard astronomer. You put your telescope in your backyard. You go to locations and you go do that. That's not a practical solution for you. And, and you know, you're, you're, you have thousands and thousands of people who do this as a hobby. You have researchers and other people. And 
yes, there will be more space telescopes, but in the meantime, if you're the person with this hobby right now, you know, and you're looking at the next few years this affecting you, it might be an impact. But the good news is you'll have fast access through the internet to the telescopes that are on the outside of this ring of satellites, thanks to this <laughs> ring of satellites. Am I wrong? Let's, let's, let's also put this in context, because I would say, I mean, Andrew, you certainly have... Uh, you know, a, a, an interest in astronomy, but I don't know anybody who has spent more deliberate time out on their back porch looking through a telescope than Brian. So, like, as somebody that this would be more affecting toward you and and the ki your, your kids that you've instilled a love of, uh, of astronomy into, like, so this does not bother you at all? You're like, eh, yeah, I mean, now, now, now we'll just be able to turn on the TV and move our our gigantic uh, uh, satellite wherever we want. That's actually a really good distinction because I feel like there are tourist level astro uh, astronomical events. Um, some of the highlights for me were uh, the first time we busted out the uh, telescope and I used an iPhone to take decent pic pictures of the moon. I remember when we tracked the Venus transit across the sun, um, and uh, uh, I, I, I believe a couple of comet sightings. Uh, all of these were backyard events that we used uh, Dobsonian, you know, I, I don't know, I think a 10 or 12 inch uh, reflective display on. Um, I don't think any of these hobbyist level events would be affected by a whole cloud of these satellites. Uh, I, I think the people chagrined are the ones who feel like they might have been able to catch the next, you know, extinction level event or the next significant whatever in their backyard. And instead, it's it's just we're, we're, we're seeing a separation from the theme park crowd, which is me and below, uh, and versus the, the pro level crowd, which are people who are going to have to subscribe to, you know, the live feed of, of I, all of the space telescopes out there. I think there's a big area between you and... The other crowd, though, there I know people who are hobbyists who spend tens of thousands of dollars a year on equipment and cameras and stuff to go out there and, and to shoot stuff and spend a considerable amount of time, you know, leaving their, you know, their telescopes out there doing long range exposures and all that who aren't pros, but they're very, very active group. And even the pro levels, you know, we have. You know, we have more sophisticated telescopes now, but getting access on that's hard. And when you want to have control and use it and when you start looking at. You know, there's there's a miserable percentage of the sky which could be obscured by these. There's a miserable, like, it's like 4 or 5% of the, I forget, you know, I saw one of these things, they showed one of the long-range telescopes and how much it's going to, can be obscure. Um, there's been statements from, uh, you know, different astronomical organizations and all that. And let me make this very clear, in case any of you are new to this podcast, I'm like super pro Starlink. <laughs> very clear. I'm with Brian, like, yay, internet access. But, you know... You know, we need to understand where these people are coming from. Yeah, you, you know what? And and this is a little bit outside of the the tech most people would expect from me. But uh, you know, we've entered an age where during our lifetime, we we regarded the oceans and the skies as essentially a common good that everybody could share, and there was no downside to doing stuff. And now we've entered a phase where, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking increasingly at carbon taxes in order to, or, or some kind of cap and trade system in order to treat this common good in such a way that it makes sure to benefit all people around it. Likewise, for the first time, I'm considering the possibility that maybe visual access to the sky has to be one of those things. Maybe it's the kind of thing where it's like, if you want to cover the, the sky with a hundred million nano uh, satellites that will on the one hand bring unprecedented universal communication interior to, to, to uh, planet earth. But on the other side, let's say removed 10% of humanity's visual access to the skies. Maybe it's not the craziest thing to consider a visual access tax to shape uh, I, 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 to shape, like, I, I guess what you would do is you would collect that money and you would spend it on access to more, uh, either creating more sa uh, 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 telescopes outside of, of the, uh, uh, we'll say the nano cloud or whatever, outside of the nano cloud um, and, and also to allow access to more people to, to see outside of that. Well, you know, the, the, 
Most of the research on cap and trade in those proposals show that they have unintended consequences, sometimes make things worse. And one is that the, the funds don't often end up where they're supposed to. And sometimes you end up incentivizing doing more of the thing you're trying to stop because once you can earn revenue from doing that. Um, that being said, is the pressure, the, the public pressure, you know, and Elon Musk respond to this is like, you know, hey, we'd be open to trying to make it more easy to help, you know, SpaceX help with astronomy. I think the public pressure side of things could be good. You know, the idea of like, you know, before we try to implement some sort of bureaucratic structure that tries to do this, uh, I certainly think that, you know, we, we should be, you know, there need to be a conversation with this. What are the solutions? You know, because I, you know, I think you and I, we agree that like the benefit of this is enormous, enormous yeah. of, of, you know, helping people in remote regions and just the more people can get online, the cheaper we get online, the better things are in general. Um, the, the one the irony that would be, wouldn't it be funny, wouldn't it be sad if we missed the asteroid that was coming towards us because of Starlink and SpaceX effort to... <laughs> well, we'd all be able to post about it. You know, that would be great. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I mean that that that's part of, and and you know me, I'm 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 uh, all the way to possible anarcho libertarian uh, status here. So it's like there's nothing about taxation that I love. But if we baked into this new thing that we're doing to change the sky, some kind of benefit that stated uh, its mission was to give us better eyes outside of that cloud, uh, that seems like that would kind of solve it. I mean, look. Whether whether or not there is a restitution there, uh, I think we are going to see. But I, I do think that there is a a very interesting moment that we are at right now, where uh, research is, of course, important. Uh, but if it does come at odds to like not only giving people, because this isn't even just about getting people internet in remote areas. Uh, uh, unless I am incorrect, this would also be going over the top of like restrictive regimes who are controlling of their internet. And, right? and like, not only that, that also solves the uh, many of the problems of um, uh, uh, there are a lot of people here in the United States in rural areas who have to rely on one carrier who has a restrictive monopoly and is able to charge a ton of money to do it. And then outside of that, you have like, what, I don't know, like uh, five dozen satellites from HughesNet that you're, you're paying a bajillion yeah. dollars for crappy internet or whatever. I mean, this would, this would be an opportunity. I suppose this is the philosophical question is are would all of us sign off on let's say there was a 10% reduction full stop in our in all of humanity's ability to see the night sky as our primitive ancestors saw it but in exchange we got instant communication all over the globe and a uh, uh we'll say 500 space telescopes that we all had as access to to see the outside world virtually better than ever before. I mean, that, if, that seems like something I would bring, sign up for. If we can bring high speed access to lesser developed countries, if we can give the level of access that we have right now to people and, and make it cheaper for people in poorer countries, that alone would be worth it. Just as the sheer benefit that it can bring them, you know, and, 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 and we, we've talked about this before, like, Cell phones radically changed other countries when making it easier for people to sell goods, bring things to market and whatever, and helps economies. Global internet, you know, has that potential too. So, yeah. It, it, it feels a little bit like, uh, I don't know, the late 1800s in, in uh, London, where it's like uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution was making possible all kinds of distribution of goods, but in the short term, you had to deal with like, you know, just the garbagiest, uh, nastiest, you know, horse poop everywhere, soot everywhere, child labor uh, getting ground up in gears all the time. Um, and yet it's hard to argue that once we're past that phase, all of those innovations were a net benefit to humanity, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm not the child in the... Yeah, no, no, no. Look, gears, I'm, what so. I'm saying is I'm very much in in favor of children being ground up in gears Cotton. and, and being <laughs> lowered oh, down like yeah, no, 100%. In, in wells, yeah. all of that. Yeah, I mean, the, the always on the edges of, of change. It's always rough. It's always difficult. And, and you know, I think that, I think that yeah, I, I'm i trying to be sympathetic to the people in astronomy and the amateurs because it's sometimes just to say, like, ah, oh, well, space, and that's not the way you're, you're, you're describing the argument. But, I mean, in some of the forums, I'm like, oh, we'll have space telescopes. And it's like great i don't what do i do now you know and and i think that there is a bit of a territorial 
thing too, though. You know, some of the astronomers, you sort of see some of the comments are kind of like, you know, the priesthood, like we should decide what happens here, you know? Yeah, well, because it, it's been their domain. Nobody has much cared about, you know, uh, stuff aside from, from a few, you know, commercial and governmental satellites. Uh, uh, we have not seen that kind of ramp up to the point where it would affect them. And so uh, now this is not just us looking out into a pastoral view, right? This is now going to be a highway that can bring commerce to the world uh and yeah it'll suck to be like well i remember when this was just a beautiful field poppies as far as the eye could see uh instead of like well and now there's a road that sure has given people jobs and money and brought us untold uh of uh, you know unlocked potential but uh man i still remember those poppies so yeah tally Zarell in the in the chat says i've never seen the milky way anyway so i wouldn't even notice that, that is kind of a shocking thing for me, and, and maybe it's because I've, I've done a bit of traveling and here or there ha have gotten the chance to see the Milky Way, but, but I don't know that I get – in a world where VR is getting better and better and better to the point where, like, maybe I'm the one who has never seen the Milky Way, and Tally Zarell will be the one who actually sees it through VR goggles once we have – 75, 100, 600 space telescopes giving the highest clarity version of it ever. So I, I, I don't know. It's it's as as we become this multicellular organism, as as we surpass uh, Dunbar's number. I, I I don't know. I you know, uh, here's the thing. When I saw the full eclipse, the full the full on, all of a sudden I can stare up at the sun and see that black disc in the sky. Um, I. Uh, knowing that I was there, knowing there was such a profound and amazing experience that it's that it's I. I think there are going to be some experiences that even though you could get it in a higher fidelity and whatever to have them digitally or whatever, there's some things that the, at least the belief that it's real or happening there is so profound. I could see though. Let's 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 do two hundred year futurology. Let's okay. let's postulate that there are now. You Welcome know, to Weird Things, episode 20,398. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, 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 there are now 500 space telescopes, and uh, they have an unprecedented level of data. Let's say also that essentially full-on retina display VR is available. Mm -hmm. And let's say a previously unknown drug is able to uh, – its only job is to erase – the perceived technological boundary between you and what you're perceiving. So what you, the thing we're, you're looking at is the Milky way and, but you're seeing it with 500 eyes and you're seeing it through a VR headset that matches neuron for neuron, uh, receptor for receptor, uh, pixel for pixel in your eye. And the only thing that keeps you from actually being in space and looking at it is your mental awareness that, you are in your room looking through all this stuff and then imagine a mild drug that just smooths those boundaries so you are getting a hundred percent accurate view of the world at the highest fidelity possible you are for let's say 40 minutes a human being in space seeing at all ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum like that seems like a net good for humanity to give everybody that experience right I mean, I think I think what Andrew's saying though is that there is the the idea that you're looking through a telescope is at least like all right, all this is is a couple mirrors, and and I'm peering into the sky. There there is a a physical kind of connection there that maybe you're right, Brian. That like maybe you can via between technology and uh, drugs kind of hack your brain into being like okay, well let's just get to that point uh, uh, through chemistry. Uh, but I don't know. I, I, I think at, at the end of the day, this is a very privileged point of view to say, no, but our scholarly research, like, like that's what we need instead of random people or not random people, people in, in low income areas, like having access to this, like global net of prosperity. <laughs> I, I mean, I certainly think that to Brian's point, like someday when we have like the Neuralink and I can plug into, you know, the very large array on the other side of the moon and feel like I am, that'd be, that'd be amazing. And that'd be cool. And that'll be levels of experiences. And I don't even know if we need our, our Schwid LSD. Um, I think at some point, 
you know, that will be a reality. And, and I can't even comprehend what the experience of things will be like then. And, and certainly we can talk a little about virtual reality a little bit later, too, because... Uh, dun, 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 oh, dun, dun, dun. save it for after the break. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I think I think it's I think it's one of the things that I think both sides need to listen to the other ones. Just you know, just to sort of understand and hear. Uh, I think that you know, understanding, you know, we've had a lot of amazing contributions from amateur astronomers, and also as amateur astronomers are doing some cool stuff, just looking at data, like you know, images of Mars and looking through there. So, uh, and I think that SpaceX has talked about the idea of trying to see if they can lower the albedo of the satellites to lower the amount of light they give off, and they're trying to be responsive towards that. And I think it's you know, on one hand, going, okay, I hear you. We'll look for ways to mitigate this. But I think ultimately, yeah, internet for everybody is kind of a good thing. So. How uh, how far off are we? From the idea of, and, and we've seen hints of this in other stories, like uh, I think it's three seconds after or whatever about the EMP or whatever. Um, how long until our ghost stories consist of, I once went eight full days without connection to the internet. And that being a legitimately terrifying story, which by the way, as I'm saying these words, might be a legitimately terrifying story already right now. How, how many of us have friends though that like go on retreats or go do stuff and unplug? Oh yeah, I mean a bunch, but but I do think that now there is there is a level of terror. Like if you were doing a horror movie, right? Like the moment that you are in the small town and you realize that you can't get onto the internet now is a horror point in the way that uh, uh, if somebody picked up a phone line and found out that it was dead, like it just makes you, it removes this kind of umbilical cord to society. Well, and, and keep in mind, there was a uh, Sam Harris has a podcast called uh, Making Sense, where he points out that uh, there are people who pay for the privilege of going on 30 day silent retreats where all they do is have their own thoughts. There are other people who are legends in the meditation community for being able to go six whole months with nothing but their thoughts. And yet with cause, with legitimate cause here in America, throwing somebody in the hole in prison where they're not allowed to talk to anybody and they're only allowed to eat, drink and have their thoughts is I think you can easily make a case for that being cruel and unusual punishment. So, so uh, I, I, I don't know when that, when and where that changes. I don't know. I, I, I do think that like, yeah, I, I've, you've been to points where all of a sudden you look down at your phone and you realize you have no signal and you feel this disconnection, this, Oh my God. And you're like, like, yeah, most of my life was like that. And, yeah. and now you take it for granted. And, you know, I went to. You know, I was just in India, and I brought with me uh, two phones and a backup phone. <laughs> uh, so, oh so, yeah, no, I I definitely made sure it was like the calls that I made before I left for for Italy was just to make sure that my AT and T mobile passport was uh, uh, on the on the line. So I got my same plan for like ten dollars a day because I didn't want to screw around with any other SIM. I didn't want to screw around with anything else. This is very important that I just got my phone to work. It, in the way that I, the way that I wanted to, but I, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I just gonna say I could see in a world like if we ever get to the point where we could like back ourselves up to the cloud and stuff. The idea of taking pla vacations in places where you can't do that, where there's you know the idea of like well you 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 know if you know if you die there you're gonna lose the last two weeks of your life. Yeah. Can I uh, confess a fantasy uh, from two week two days ago? Yes, uh, I was I was trying to think. I was trying to think of what framework to do this. And maybe this will turn into something at some point, but I was like, um, okay. Okay. So I, I've spent 12 years establishing a footprint on the internet and being this guy uh, on various programs and, and doing my best to get on TV and all that stuff. And then uh, there was a moment that I thought, what would it feel like to just not be that guy? And, and to just go away, spend cash and have a fake ID or, or maybe buy a fake ID and ride on a motorcycle and get back to a place where my full attention needed to be on where I was present in the moment and not about managing my brand, keeping in mind long going narratives or tracking the analytics of this thing or that thing. And I, I got to admit there was, there was a real appeal to it and 
I, 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 I don't know. Like, like, do you guys perceive any value in being an unperson for some amount of time? Because like, there's part of me that thinks like, what, a, what a unique, amazing vacation to just all the money that you would have spent, you know, in Cancun and all the creature comforts or whatever instead gets spent in real time interactions to other people. And, and, you know, maybe even making a game out of it where it's like, I'm going to run in a random direction as far as I can. And the first person to say, Hey, Brian Brushwood, you have to go back to work. You're the winner. You get a thousand dollars cash. And I go back to work like that for some reason, like that fantasy held tremendous appeal to me. And I'm really surprised by that. I'm just, 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 just the, sometimes the look inside of your mind, Brian. <laughs> I mean, j just it's because delightful. it's it's the opposite. Uh, I, 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 it's 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 a uh, call it a Brian Crazy Ivan, where it's like every so often I stop and I just look in the exact opposite direction of everything I've worked my whole life for, and I wonder what that might look like. And and the best I could come up with is a is a fantasy vacation where I try to run away and the world catches me. <laughs> You know, our first ever weird things, We are one of the first ever, we did an imagination scenario. I'm like, what if you're the last person alive? And Brian's was, the pants come off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, I hear you. I think that, you know, we, that you, you wake up every day and the older you get, the more responsibilities you have, you know, and the more you feel like there's a thing you have to do and you have to keep moving that direction. It's like you're on a train and sometimes you just want to jump off the train. Well, and, and I don't even mean in like, like I have a deep seated desire to do that, but, uh, you know, they call them intrusive Not thoughts. That uh, yeah, they call them intrusive yeah, thoughts. I, yeah. I, but Brian, I would, I would not separate the fact that you are currently at a point where however much you were in charge of things, uh, a year ago, you are in charge of many more things this year and infinitely more things over the next two years. So it's like, I do think that that is probably, I, Hey, I ain't no Siggy Freud here, but like I'm, I'm saying that maybe there is a connection between that blossoming supernova of responsibility and your desire to just hop the rails and then take your bindle I mean, to where you're, nobody, you're, nobody knows. Then you can just be checking out your hobo code to see which kindly old lady will feed you a piece of rhubarb. You're not wrong. That's the, I mean, I mean, yes, you, you got it right on the nose and, and I'm very aware of where these ideas come from but but i do think it's fascinating because i used to be of the mindset where it's like uh what good is privacy who wants privacy right uh but then as i live in this small town and more and more places that i go to to grab a bite to eat uh before i have a chance to speak tell me what they already know i want to eat and drink i'm just like well, I'm I I suddenly understand the impulse to to want to be anonymous, to want to be uh, none of this. I I think it's gonna be interesting if we have a considerably longer lifespans and we don't feel certain kinds of pressure. I think that it'd be interesting to see that like what it means you know, the, the sabbaticals and the things and being able to go be different things, do different things. You know, feel like it's it's not uh, a whimsy to do that would be neat. I mean, yeah, it, it's. To be totally honest, throughout my life, I've kind of moved every like five or six years. You know, it's just been a thing that like now we're coming up on like seven years here in California. And part of me is like, all right, yeah, time to uh, burn my life and, and, and cash those chips in somewhere else. Like, let, let's go. I am done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you what. Uh, yeah. uh, the, the, the first thing I would do if I when I went to a new town is I would make sure that I still, in my budget, had uh, uh, money for patreon.com slash weird things. Uh, the best thing about totally abandoning uh, all responsibilities and obligations and moving out to a new, uh, new place is that you can still have our dulcet tones in your ear. And if you go ahead and subscribe on patreon.com slash weird things, you can also get our After Things podcast earlier than anybody else does. Uh, this is Brian Just or Brian Justin, Brian Andrew and myself uh, talking about entrepreneurship and making things and uh, living your life as a creator, folks. It's so simple. Patreon.com/slash/weirdthings. So we got a cool uh, update from uh, they're right now doing the Worldwide Developers Conference for Apple, which is you know the next generation software and everything else is coming out. And one of the things that was really exciting, they announced a couple of them a year, 
two years ago, I think, was AR Kit. And AR Kit was Apple's version for how to do AR. Google has AR Core, which they've been you know supporting really well. And AR Kit makes it very easy to pick up your phone and look through it and see things floating in real, you know, looks like really in your environment. And we think that you know that's going to lead to the future where we're going to put on like you know Microsoft Hololenses or other systems and be able to interact with augmented reality. Apple just unveiled some really cool things for this, including um, if you put a person in the frame, it will model their body, and so if this person moves, it will capture their motions, and you can apply it to a object like a robot or something. So it mo mo measures your body, and also body occlusion so if let's say you wanted to play minecraft with a friend and you look through the viewer and you see the minecraft environment the person would be standing in front of it and, and blocking out the stuff behind exactly exactly which is a big step because one of the things that sort of destroys the reality of ar is if you put your hand in front of your face you know you just see the object floating in front of your hand because your hands in back of that image but now with real body occlusion it's a very, very big step, but I'm sure we'll be seeing versions of that for other platforms because, you know, when you, you want to get to that world where we put on our goggles and we see each other and we really feel like we're in that environment. But the fact they can do that on a phone right now is pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah you know, well, what's funny is uh, for the last five, 10 years, we've graded everything with the provisio of or, or the proviso of like, and it's done on a, on a phone. Increasingly, as they become, you know, supercomputers, that that becomes the least impressive part of the story, right? Like instead it just becomes like they're able to do this, this and that. And it doesn't matter that it's on a phone. I mean, certainly there's uh, <clears throat> just the idea of doing it or having it available. And, and AR is one of those technologies that has yet to fully, I think, find a home because we have yet to fully find exactly how we want to use it. Al like, along along that line, uh, uh, tell us about your new toy, Andrew. So Oculus uh, revealed, unveiled uh, two new uh, developments. One was improvement on Rift, a new headset for the Rift. The other one is their their standalone, their first six degree of freedom, freedom standalone, which is the Oculus Quest, which retails for $400. And um, the only other, I think, 60F is the, I have over here, was the, the Google Day game, which was, you know, pretty cool, but it had one controller, and it didn't have, uh, I didn't say as much power or as capabilities maybe it could have. The Quest functions much like a regular Oculus. You've got your two controllers with feedback, whatever. This is all standalone. There's no PC to hook this up to. There's nothing you have to do. You don't have any, like, with Vive, you don't have any lighthouses. It uses cameras here, here, here on the sides to track your environment around you. When you put it on, you use a controller to map out your space, you know, your environment to say this is where my, my no-go zone is. And from there, you're fully immersed. Now, um, I have I have a lot of different, you know, gear. I've been buying, you know, headsets and VR stuff back since I had a Nintendo Virtual Boy. Um, I had the you know, original Oculus developer uh, kit and played with that and played with that in Unity and Real and whatnot. So I've been following this for a while and waiting for that moment where I go, okay, this this is the, we'll call it like the iPad moment. You know, you had, Microsoft had tablets, their tablets, their things back in the 90s. You know, you had the Newtons, General Magic, all that sort of stuff. But finally, when the iPad came out, you're like, okay, this is it. You know, this really solidifies what we're looking for. And I think for VR, this may be it. I've played with this. I've played several hours of this, the Quest, and I love it. I think that it's the tracking is fantastic. The controllers are wonderful. Now, if you have a PC system and you're already doing Vive or Oculus on there, the graphics are a downgrade. It's, it's using a mobile processor for the graphics. So I think for people who already have those systems, might be like, oh, I prefer my PC system. But being untethered and whatnot, amazing. So much to my surprise, we just watched the uh, the B-roll of the marketing for this and everything still took place inside a room. It seems to me the real value of this, because I, I think I'm 100% on board. I'm, I'm a happy Vive enthusiast, but I think I would immediately buy this if there were five games that encouraged me to run outside. And I understand there are tremendously, uh, there's all kinds of security concerns or whatever. But I remember there was a um, an app, uh, Zombies Run, that was purely audio-based, and it would track how fast you were jogging, and then if it felt like you were jogging underneath the level you should be, you would hear zombies coming up, and a radio would come on, and be like, oh my gosh, uh, runner, uh, they're coming up behind you. You gotta keep on going, or whatever. 
Uh, it seems to me that's the real value in this. If you can somehow uh, keep me safe from cars, from obstacles, from whatever, and meanwhile, I'm just running in circles around my neighborhood with this thing over my head, but it's in a fantasy world where I'm ch either chasing down Pokemon or running from zombies or whatever. That feels like, yeah, like that's a slam dunk. I would do that in a second. I don't care how high quality the visuals are. Bryce, when you get a chance, play the video I sent you. Um, and uh, so here's the challenge for, for the quest, doing it outdoors, they have what's called arena mode. So there is a mode in the developer mode where you can do arena mode, which is a very wide open landscape. Um, I think the real challenge is just that because the uh, the sensors use infrared is for the camera to be able to see where your hand sensors are. But people have been using this outdoors. Um, and I'll find another link for you. And people have been using outdoors and whatnot. So you're watching a guy playing this in a very large environment out in the field. Now, it looks like they're using an AR type of experience, not a VR experience. Is that right? Andrew, because it's uh, or, no, it's well, totally no, yeah, real. it looks totally VR. Uh, 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 yeah. I guess that's that's the question is is um, my guess is they're going to be slow to roll this out because of the safety concerns. How uh, is it going to know anyone's around you or express that information? Well, I, I would I think uh, you know if 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 Brian were satisfied with running around a track you know, then you can do what Brian wants to do now. I think the, the larger, the, the security question is like, if you want to run on the side of the road, if you want to run on your sidewalk, then obviously there is going to be, uh, you know, certain safety measures that will have to be in place before that's anything advertised or marketed at least. But uh, uh, I think the idea, as soon as you untether it from a larger machine, then yeah, a lot of outdoor stuff is, is now possible. Uh, and and will only continue to get more interesting because four hundred dollars is is you know that's that's a price point that will get a couple people in a field doing something right you know if, if it gets down to you know a hundred two hundred uh, now you you really have uh, you know a, a a bigger kind of thing well, and keep in mind it was on this very podcast that uh, Andrew was speculating what five six years ago the idea that we could go to Zilker Park. And that all of us could have an, uh, a five-on-five role-play uh, fantasy weapon extravaganza. And, and we would just have VR uh, seeing something much more spectacular than the play-pretend environment in our heads. Yeah, I just said, Bryce, another video. And it's not the one I was looking for. But now what's cool with these things is they can network. And you can have multiple people in the same room playing it. It's like when we did the Void experience. The Void was cool, but our reaction was kind of like... Well, this is the same hardware people have in their homes, and you know the th the advantage here is you just have a larger space to walk around in. Now, uh, you know, I played I played the game of Vader Immortal, uh, which is was a collaboration of Oculus and XILM, or Lucasfilm's you know VR lab, and I loved it. It was amazing. You know, I'm in Darth Vader's castle. I'm fighting with lightsabers. I'm fighting robots and stuff. It's an immersive story thing that's coming out in multiple parts. And I can replay it. And was that as, you know, the only difference between that experience and playing the void with my friends was the void was with my friends. But if you can let my friends play that game with me, you know, I, I don't I'm not big on the whole idea of destination VR or being on the high end. But I am big on the idea of like VR dojos and, you know, the idea of like, you know, just Brian has over it is, you know, compound has a space that's a VR space. Yeah, as a matter of fact, now that I'm thinking about it, um, I could totally see. So imagine the default option is you spend $50 a month for a gym membership. Uh, so instead of spending that and then having to decide for yourself to go or whatever, what if there's a $50 membership, a commitment device that you make financially and you can earn all that $50 back and then some just by scoring points in this app? So, so, so it's like you have committed to putting $50 out there and then uh, as much or as little as you feel like it, you go hunting and you put on the, the Oculus uh, quest, you run outside, you, you jump, you shoot, you roll, you burn the right number of calories. And then guess what? You get a refund of everything you committed and it's, and you're subsidized. Your experience is subsidized by all the people who weren't as serious about getting fit as you were. And then and you have like a, a freestanding market that shifts over time. Yeah, or just at the very use is just 
very least like building like gyms and do, like you just pay a membership fee and you know that you can you and your friends can go in there and have a wider open space with multiple levels or things designed for stuff you know i think that just that alone like again this the free range aspect i am if you want to get into vr in i i i highly recommend the quest to anybody who's curious to play with it um and again like i said if, you, if you're coming already from the vive or oculus with the the pc the, the the downgrade for you is the graphics aren't as intensive as that is but I think this is the future for all of that. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I mean, number one, the, the processing will only continue to get better and better. Uh, and also VR to me is about feeling in the moment, you know, and, and if this gives you, if it's easier now to do that without worrying about tripping over stuff like you do with the vibe with the cord, mm -hmm. then that's awesome. Uh, I, I do wonder though, uh, you know, I think that the most exciting thing is is what you were talking about, Andrew, that there could be these spaces where it's like, oh, cool. Like, you know, on, on Wednesdays, they always run groups for a certain game or or they're going to like they're going to bring in this and they're going to rearrange their large room. So it's better or optimized for this one experience. Uh, there's one of my favorite things to do in San Francisco is is closing. Actually, it's a this gigantic uh, immersive theater thing uh, called the Speakeasy which on one hand is always great because they you have all these great actors and it's this play that you follow whoever you want uh, through this one night at a 1920s speakeasy. But on the other hand, the really cool thing that I always liked about it is that they just created a great immersive environment. And you have to wonder, mm -hmm. what is the scale down? I mean, they're closing because it's really expensive to own that uh, place and, and pay all those actors and keep the liquor license if you're not running it as like a bar or a restaurant every uh, every night. So... Uh, what is the sustainable scaled down version of that where it's like, hey, look, let, let's just throw on these things. And, and now, you know, well, it's a it's a crazy horror murder mystery one night. And, and then it's a, a, a big, uh, you know, a, a awesome paintball kind of experience on on Tuesdays and on Wednesdays. It's secret ninja day. <laughs> like it's. Oh. That, yeah, I was thinking about like you combine that with the escape room kind of thing and you get like, oh, we could take we could borrow a space. A hotel or whatever and give people a tour of the titanic and then you end up in a small room and you take it off and it's one it's like looks like a private dining room and you have a dinner you know then you put your headgear back on and go back through and take another tour of the titanic or some lost thing and you can mix real world elements with you know the virtual and i think yeah the whole the kind of experiences could be amazing you know you look at you know I, I would, attractions i would bet this is a Vegas. This sounds like a Vegas idea because there's like s nothing but nothing but space and warehouse space close to where you could do stuff. If not like really close to the the, the strip or downtown where you could do something really really awesome with these. So I, I now I'm taking a step farther and I'm thinking about like uh, uh, payment models or or monetization. Like what if you did? Let's say you didn't even want to spend $50 a month on some kind of virtual gym membership and earn your money back. What if instead you wanted to either get paid or, or earn the right to have your Oculus Quest for free? We could call it Quality Quest or whatever, where your job is to, uh, if, if you get uh, 500 quality credits, then you get to keep having your Oculus Quest for free, but your quality credits are earned by you physically running to different places where you're given an A-B test of like, which is the cooler title, uh, Titan Station or Station Omega? And then you pick, and then and what you're really doing is you're giving, you're essentially becoming a test audience for, for somebody else's project, and you don't even know what the project is, but meanwhile, the benefit you're getting is, is you're burning calories and earning points that keep you in, in your free uh, Oculus Quest. You know, I, that, that's, that's an interesting idea. Uh, I, I was actually thinking, like, if you had, like, the, the game that we were watching on the B-roll was a kind of paintball-esque sort of, like, people shooting at each other, I assume eliminating each other. Uh, like, are we at a point now where if these avatars that are, you know, like, physical and real and you know it's your friends, how far, are we, uh, uh, how far away are we from, like, just low-scale, highly commoditized just endorsements? That, hey, would you like $5 to make sure that your avatar in this game just wears a gigantic Visa logo and, and now you're like you're just buying into endorsements uh, where it's like, oh, cool, I get I get paid. And it's nothing. Right. Well, you can do it just for like 
to look cool. And, and I like, mean, you, Oculus, you know, those rebels there, it's not like they're backed by Facebook, which would, you know, try to. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes to everything. Uh, so I uh, highly, highly recommend this, though. I've been I have not been this delighted with a VR thing since like i played you know i first played the vibe and i remember telling you guys like oh you got to try six degrees of freedom guys you got to try this and and we're all like well i've done vr like no not like this and then you do it and it's like it's amazing and this without the cables without all that and you know i i put tilt brush hand on it told my girlfriend hey why don't you try this 45 minutes later i'm watching her play with my vr gear and like why did i let her do this you know Ah. it's that kind of experience and i'll tell you what's cool too is What's come a long ways now is web-based experiences. There's a framework called A-Frame that allows you to take basically do JavaScript sort of 3D virtual reality stuff. And so there's a game called like uh, Moonbeam Writer, I think it is, which is browser-based. You put on the you put on the Oculus, you open up the browser, and you click on Moonwriter. There you go. And it's basically like a Beat Saber knockoff, but it's done completely across the web through a browser. Oh wow! Wow. And just to see what's you know possible with that is incredible because you're like wow this is all web based and there's actually uh, networked a frame like so you could you know I could create a site that you know my friends could go into a 3D environment and I could send you links and we could all meet up in there and totally without having to download any software just browser based alone so um, it's very very exciting so, cool that was my pick oh, oh, we're picks picks already. Hey, I saw three movies on the flight back. Go on. I saw uh, Venom, uh, which I fell asleep during. (laughs) I don't know how much of that was the fact that Venom was kind of a boring uh, movie uh, and and how much of it was because I was on an international flight. So anyway, Justin, I just want to let you know very directly, I am an alien that speaks English and inhabiting your body right now. Let me explain 27 more points to the plot of all this and then give you direct instructions on how to handle the end of it. It's me, Venom. What's going on? Yeah, yeah, you're not wrong. There's a lot of that. Listen, I was listening to Night Attack, where what I'm doing right now is exactly what you said would make a good movie. So hey, how do you feel about it now, me, Venom? <laughs> uh, it kind of gets everything that I like about the symbiote wrong. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I, I guess it, Venom's such a weird character, because I think the, the reason why some people like it uh, is you know, just a purely sort of physical, uh, you know, just like looking like, oh, cool, gigantic, roided out venom with uh, sharp teeth uh, eating people is like cool. It's like badass. It's like something you want to draw in your notebook or like have on a heavy metal album cover. Uh, Yeah, it's almost like I'm a physical manifestation of your rage made flesh, and you wish that you could experience that rage made flesh, but what you don't necessarily want is a constant dialogue in your ear explaining to you how I am rage made flesh. Anyway, it's me, Venom. Don't worry about it. Continue with your podcast. Yeah, yeah. All right, so anyway, uh, I fell asleep during Venom, and... uh, Woody Harrelson's wig in the uh, after credit sequence is ridiculous. It is a ridiculous, like, I have no idea. Like, uh, it's, it's, and beyond the fact that if they're going to do Carnage and another Venom thing, then uh, it, would it be crazy to just have the plot, you know, every once in a while just be like, oh, there's a murderer on the loose. Like, and then the murderer gets caught. And then eventually you find out that it's, what is it, Colin Cassidy, the, the, you got the Venom, anyway, or the Carnage. Long story short, I fell asleep during that. Uh, I did watch Bohemian Rhapsody, which I really, really uh, liked a lot more than I thought I was going to. I, I really had heard that it was uh, kind of trash. And, and look, it is very biopic It is it, right down. It, it's, it's got all the biopic stuff, you know, right down to the, the, the troubled relationship with the father and the, uh, the, 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 the secret that will eventually be the undoing. Uh, but uh, really, my one review of Bohemian Rhapsody, beyond enjoying it as you know as a plain movie, is they really, really went for it with that Wayne's World joke, middle of a movie about what? 
Oh no, Brian, there's a moment in the movie where a, a record producer being played by Mike Myers in heavy prosthetics uh, uh, is arguing that Bohemian Rhapsody will never be released as a single uh, and says, why don't you do I'm in love with my car? That's the kind of song that a bunch of teenagers could roll their windows down and sing along with. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, okay. I mean, look, at the end of the day, that's the reason why I like Queen. I like Queen because I love Bohemian Rhapsody in Wayne's World. It turned me on to the band, which I eventually love. So I guess it was, like, interesting that it, it felt that strongly about it to have Mike Myers remind you that he made Wayne's World. Well, especially uh, because, like, at the time, he was ashamed that they were putting Wayne's World stuff in the video that, of, of Bohemian Rhapsody. He felt like it was it was a, a, a violation of everything that was awesome of Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Uh, and then I watched uh, Fighting With My Family, the uh, WWE movie uh, about the star Paige, and that was not great, even as a movie that, like, to – that could explain kind of wrestling. Although, uh, very fun uh, pairing of uh, uh, Nick Frost and Lena Headley as her parents that are real-life people, real-life wrestling promoters in uh, England. And uh, their, their portrayals are so spot-on that they then start playing clips from a documentary that was made about the family. And you realize that some of the more outrageous, ridiculous lines that are in the movie are like literal things that were said by these two people on this documentary. So that was fun. Dude, I've watched so much stuff over the last two weeks. Uh, it's, you know, what's rad. I highly recommend getting an 11 year old who expresses an active interest in learning what movies she needs to have seen. We watched close encounters of the third kind. We watched poltergeist. She binged both seasons of uh, stranger things. Uh, we ended up starting on Logan last night. It's so much fun to be able to be uh, the the Sherpa to explain to a kid what's clever about X, Y, and Z. But uh, my pick is a little movie that I watched just for me, just for yours truly, a little movie called Deadwood. You ever hear of it? Oh, uh, it's out. Yep, it's out, and uh, uh, it's great. Um, I, I, I Let me qualify that. If you have spent a decade waiting for closure... Congratulations. It's here and waiting for you. And it's it's done a great job of reminding you of why things are the way they are and why you should feel the way you feel. It's delightful and wonderful. And I guess I read in an article that uh, David Milch is 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 descending into Alzheimer and dementia. Um, and uh, it makes it all the more bittersweet. So when I was bursting out in tears, it was for many reasons, both for the fact that the world moves on, both for the thankfulness of, uh, you know, three episodes, uh, three seasons of this wonderful story, uh, and for the, the fact that its creator is 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 descend is descending away. Yeah, and David Milch famously uh, hasn't always been the clearest vessel, even when he was a younger man. Oh, uh, he he earned he earned his destination. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, uh, a guy who, uh, you know, NYPD Blue was his big uh, his big break, and that wound up uh, uh, kind of descending to the point where he just wouldn't write scripts. He would just tell the actors on set what to say <laughs> uh, uh, because he was, uh, you know, substance abuse and stuff like that. So uh, Deadwood, to me, is really his masterwork in terms of like really uh, leaning into his flair for kind of like a, a stylized dialogue uh, and creating this like version of the old West that, you know, may or may not be realistic, but you feel it, it feels authentic. I Whether definitely, I, I was so, so thankful when I threw out the call of, I wanted somebody who hadn't seen Deadwood to watch Deadwood and Vi uh, Bryce volunteered his tribute and oh, yeah. uh, and 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 instantly, like twenty minutes in, he's like, "Yay, verily, what the f word? I don't understand why people talk this way." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, forgot to mention." Yeah, 
Uh, all of that, like, because I had been listening to you, because you guys watched Deadwood on on Court Killers, and none uh, of all the things that I thought I knew about Deadwood, I thought they speak like they're in a Shakespeare play <laughs> would have been something I picked up. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It, it, no, it's not, yeah, it, it's a Shakespeare play with with, with a few choice uh, c words, few choice curse words, kind of uh, thrown in, but that's that's David Milch, and and look, when you get the reason why Deadwood's special for him is that you get something that felt pretty <clears throat> real but had this fanciful element that never distracted from it in a way that some of his other stuff, like John from Cincinnati, for example, uh, it's just that that's all extravagance. That's all ridiculousness. And even if you like the show, it's like it, there's nothing authentic about it. Nothing feels real about it. Uh, I have a pick. Um, I'm going to talk about it very broadly because I know Brian's, uh, only just started it and 10 I, minutes in it's about 10 minutes in and i think that um even though they are selling the thing about this game uh pretty up front uh i think i went into it not knowing anything about it other than it had just come out uh and was had a really fun time playing it it's a uh, this new game from uh, annapurna called outer wilds um i'll explain the very beginning right you wake up under the stars and you see you see the planets and the, you can see the sky is moving super fast because it's, you know, it's a video game. So the day and night cycle is super fast. And uh, you're you're in this village and you go and you talk to everyone and, and they let you know, oh, yeah, hey, you're the astronaut. Congrats. Wait, good. Uh, uh, you're, you're up. Hey, you're going to go out into space today. And, uh, uh, you, you know, they go through the tutorial stuff. You're like, oh, you know, you can play with the lander. You can do the zero G stuff. It's a space exploration game. Uh, and one of the people you talk to is like, hey, what are you going to do? when you get out onto space and you can do anything you, you're kind of you don't are not given any uh you're not given a plan you're not given anything to do um and you get out there and you start to explore the you know it's about six planets or so and you find a, a very compelling thing you find a very a very good story there uh and there's there's a lot of really it's, it's very I'll, good i'll uh, tell you this i'll tell you I'm, this much yeah. i'm utterly entranced in just the first 10 minutes yeah, and you have not even gotten are. off the planet i have not gotten off the planet but yeah. but just the casualness you know you walk up and you 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 look down and you're like oh these are all aliens and you look down at your hands you're like oh i guess i'm an alien mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you're like who am i where am i and it's like well everybody seems real friendly and proud of me and i guess i better yeah. practice this lunar lander thing before i guess i take off or yeah. whatever the kids are super all in i'm all in and i get the vibe that it that it's something I should share with the kids. Is, is that, is that, yeah, accurate? yeah, you can share it with them. Yeah. There, it's, it's, um, it, uh, it, it has some narrative stuff into it. It has some, some very minor action -y stuff to it, but I think most people could play it and, and get through the thing that it's doing. Um, and it's, it's really smart in the way that it does some of the stuff. I, I, I this just came out, so I really don't want to talk it, openly uh, about uh, it. But this uh, is, this is, would it, would it, it be fair to say this feels like the video game equivalent of like, the movie Moon. It feels like an indie movie that mm. happens to be a video game, or, or or the video game Firewatch, where it's like I'm really excited to uncover oh. a deeper story. I I would even say it's closer to, uh, I, it, it's a little bit like Firewatch, but I think it's closer to like a classic point and click adventure game. I mean, it is you are uncovering different parts of the world, more as, like the the, the Walking Dead uh, adventures. No, because I think both. I think even that is still very lin like when, when you get out into space in this game, uh, it's open. You it. go anywhere and do whatever you'd like in whatever order, um, or like Mist. I guess it it feels very very similar to Mist, but you have free controls. You have a jetpack. You are you have oxygen, and you're doing these these jetpack bits. It, it's it's very cool, and it has some like real science in it. I don't know if you get to the museum in the village, but there's real earth science uh wow. that your kids will learn at least a little bit uh, 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 yeah outer wilds. Uh, you can get this on the epic Games store right now they're offering like ten dollars off we are not sponsored by this no. but uh, i think it's it's defaulted at 25 dollars. but i think it's only 15 dollars if you buy it right yeah now. and it's on uh xbox and the xbox game pass so yeah. uh if you have that it's also free for you there and my provisional endorsement is based on 10 minutes of the first <laughs> beginning of well it. yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, and I know Brant, Brant is also huge into it, too. He, he's a couple hours in. So, uh, Outer Wilds, please. Just a blind faith recommendation if uh, if you like video games. Excellent. Um, 
like I said, my pick is The Quest. Take a look at it. If you're into VR, check it out. Uh, and I want to say that the amount of hardware, the amount of capability they're able to put into a $400 device, it's very clear that Facebook and is selling these probably razor-thin margins, if at all. Um, I mean, it is, you know, the, the controllers have, I was surprised they had vibrating feedback on them. The room scale sensing is incredible. Uh, there's a $400 version one and a $500 one. The difference is storage, okay. just if you don't want to have to, you know, offload games, but doesn't affect performance or anything. So probably the $400 one's the most sensible option for most people. And the thing that that surprises me, and I think is is worth noting, is because they had the Oculus Go before mm -hmm. this, right? Which was also a standalone, but this is the library of this is not the Go games. This is closer to the Rift games where they are like like uh, Beat Sabers on here, Super Hots on here, uh, you know, more more bigger experiences and not the like little mobile phone experiences that the other standalone VR systems have been using right now, right? Yeah, this is the Go. Um, the Go is cool, but the Go is it's not six degrees of freedom. It's you know your head's on a swivel looking around, mm -hmm. and the controller is just sort of the point click so yeah you're getting games that were designed more for like the desktop you know rift games are being ported over to it because it has it not the same processing power as far as you know the desktop sure. um because it's you know trying to compete with the pc with the graphics cards hard but capabilities you walk around like it's six degrees of freedom if you have a large space you just walk around your space and you're in there if you're in a spaceship like you know playing vader immortal you walk around the space and you feel like you're in there and the controllers the feedback it's the same thing it senses where they are in space so it's pretty much the exact same experience you get in a vive or oculus uh the only difference is just you know the graphics are a little bit more simpler in this yeah i'm th this the price every time i hear it is crazy to me because it also includes the wireless remotes and stuff that yep. stuff is so yep. expensive on the wired one wow i think it, i think they're planning to make a big bet on this i think this may become the default platform wow no. that'd be great yep yeah cool all right folks it's been weird hey that's a show yeah, yeah. all righty uh anybody need a break uh yeah i gotta i gotta peep all in right, the potty back. okay <clears throat> Hey Bryce. Hi Justin. Welcome back. Hey, look at this. We yes. gotta do. We gotta do this part we again. The thing again. Great. Oh man. So when did you go back in in the country on Friday? Friday. Friday. I uh, literally I texted. You were the first person that I texted. <laughs> you were the first person who texted me to yeah, let me know that you I, had deleted it, it, Twitter from your phone again. I deleted Twitter from my phone again. So I figured you were the only. You were the first person <laughs> that needed to know that I deleted Twitter from my phone again. Uh -uh. I had it on for the for the uh, for the vacation. Twitter's an angry place, man. Like it's hard, like going back to like, cause all right, look, now that Twitter's been cut out of my life, like I've still been on, right? Yeah. But when I, in my view of it, we're like I'm mainlining it. Like there's just there's a certain amount of social networking that I just like habitually just go back to all the time. I am just like addicted to it when it's on my phone. Yeah. And going back to that with Twitter, man, whew, there's a lot of like, just a lot of things. It's still, there, there's an intensity yeah. on Twitter that is just like unmatched on any other social media network. Like it, it, it is, it is like, it is the the thing that's happening mm -hmm. is that like there is high intensity drama at all times. Sure. Uh, wherever, whatever you want, somebody is really dialed into it. And they are making moves. They are like, this is, identify yourself. Are you with us or against us mm -hmm. on, on all matter? I'm not even just saying like politics or social war or culture war kind of stuff. Like, you know, wrestling and art and music and everything. There is just like right now, up our enemies, shoot them. Our, 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 uh, we honor our fallen comrades like it is just mm -mm. Uh, it's an all or nothing place I, uh, I, I've i been a little more um, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm I, I've kind of am giving myself the right to just unfollow anybody I want like, like I think I think that's what a lot of it just comes down to is the people kind of you put onto your timeline um, but I've just you know, I, it, I, I'm at a point where it's like, if if there's a twinge, I go and I check it out, and 
I give him the I give him the audit. I give him the audit and no. Yeah, that's that's the thing though, is that it's not even really for me about like the stuff that's damaging or ugly or toxic. It's it's like uh the friend that's like retweeting somebody that's like, hey, like I'm close to suicide. Mm. Like you want to donate to my thing or, or I'm, I'm open for commissions yeah. or something like that. Like, and that's not a specific example, but it is something that is like, ooh, sorry. you know, degrees of that happen on a fairly regular basis. And it's like, all right, cool. Like that's signal boosting a good thing. That's cool. I don't have a problem with that. But at the same time, like, mm -hmm. man, that's intense. <laughs> like yeah. that's, that, that, that is a, that's a low moment being broadcast on a, on a big platform. And I, I don't, have any particular in you know i don't have an instinct to be like that's wrong that's bad but i i will say it's intense <laughs> well and for me like the space that twitter occupies i just don't know what i would replace it with i don't know what i could replace it with start you know? doing instagram stories and we'll do instagram stories and i'll tag you and you can tag me and we'll we'll be friends on instagram stories okay do that One let's time. start the world's largest uh uh, uh i message group I, listen, all I'm saying is this. I had a great time on Instagram stories watching uh, uh, all the amazing wedding that Andrew was at in, uh, in in India. And then, you know, just be amazing wedding, amazing wedding, amazing wedding, Andrew eating breakfast. <laughs> this, this is the social media that I signed up for. This is exactly what I want. And, and to be clear, I had nothing to do with any of that. I have no idea what was posted there. So. Oh, yeah, no, it was all Rajneesh. Yeah, Yeah, I know, yeah. Well, on Instagram, Instagram stories let you do text now too, right? Or they have like text slides or something. Because that's the thing is like, I the thing I like about Twitter that Instagram, like at least the, the timeline doesn't replace for me is that you have to have a photo for everything where like, I don't know, I like making poopy jokes on Twitter. And yeah, I guess I guess I could do stories. No, look, it, it is it, it nothing replaces the, the, the hive mind that is Twitter. It, yeah. Twitter is its own thing. It, there's a reason why I deleted it from my phone and I haven't just deleted my account or left because like it's irreplaceable. It's mm. great. Uh, but also, man, better as a thing that I do once or twice a day than it is something that I do 30 times a day. And that is like what yeah. happens. I know myself if it's on my phone, even if it's buried in some back thing and it's not like right there in front of my face, I will go to it 50 times a day, which is what I did every day while I was on vacation. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, I sent you a few emails the other day, including an after things question um, from a uh, 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 from a listener. This was on yeah, uh, the after things one's good. I actually looked that up just to make sure that I wasn't going to say something stupid. Oh, cool, great. Well, then let me prep that to go on the air. We'll do that. Ooh, okay, let's just shrink it a little bit. Yeah, I thought this was a very good email. Let's see. Mm. Ooh, don't do that. Uh, when did you get back in the country, Andrew? From India. I got back um, <clears throat> Monday a week ago, 3 or 4 p.m. Um, now ask me when I got over the jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to guess TVD. Yeah, I think they're finally getting better now. But yeah, it was several days of just you know feeling so out of it mm -hmm. so out of it you know i actually i was bad going out uh but i think i pretty much escaped it coming back uh i i really haven't crashed that was really what what it was when i was out there was that like even if i was getting sleep at the right time like i would just in the middle of the day be, just be like meow and your power down mm -hmm. all right all right i'm good to go now for after things with this question uh yeah you guys good we're, yep we're the best all right then whenever you're ready hello and welcome to after things i'm andrew main joined by justin robert young hello bryce castillo hello, 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 hello. <laughs> brian brushwood hi <laughs> Let's jump right into a question. And this is really a good one. Um, <clears throat> hey there, weird boys. Um, we'll take it. 
I'd love to hear all of your takes on pen names. I've decided to come up with a pen name for the first book I'm working on because I share an identical name, including middle name, with a famous person. This is by George Washington, by the way. I've been looking into everything I can online about how to go about doing this, but it's really unclear as to whether I have to use my legal name or my pen name on the copyright notice in the book. Sources differ on this. Would it defeat the purpose if I had to print my legal name in the copyright section, the name on the copyright paper that holds the copyright, regardless of the fact that the copyright paperwork states the pseudonym? Anyone know of a way around this? I've read about people filing copyright strictly under the pseudonym and not identifying the legal names on the paperwork, but this causes problems in the future if there's an issue of proving that you're the legal copyright holder. I've heard of people using coded number languages to embed a secret message in the book, a standard numbers that basically translates, so I'm so-and-so and I'm the legal copyright holder for this book in case they ever need to prove it. That seems crazy. There's got to be a better way. I don't want my legal name available to the public through the copyright office, the copyrighted from the book, scratching my head over this. Thoughts, experiences, Selena. Um, not really named George Washington. I lied about that. I'm sorry. What, uh, do, you, what do you think of the last name? Gomez? It's probably a very good guess. Yeah. I probably ask go. I, I, I bet Gomez. I okay, think it's go. the other Selena. Um, she didn't put her last name in there, though. But um, Maybe it's yeah. uh, John Slanina. Of twit fame, it could be. Yeah, it could be JRB. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, anyhow, um, as far as that goes, like, yeah, the copyright office says you can use a pseudonym. You can use another name, and of course, the problem is if somebody else comes up and says, "Hey, I'm that person," you then have to establish that, like, no, no, I am. And you still, if you ever try to take a copyright to court, you still have to prove priority to it. A copyright, a filed copyright, it can establish that you filed it first but it's not ironclad either. So what I've done is I have an LLC, and it's my same name. It's Andrew Main, and I've done doing business as, so I've established that. Also, when you create a work, let's say if you write a book and you publish it, um, the medium in which it's published can help establish that. So if you make it available on Amazon's Kindle and that data first availability or whatever can help establish that. I found that, like... I don't know of anybody really getting it, having difficulty establishing priority on this. I think that it's often as, you know, first time authors, we worry a lot about establishing copyright and it's really never the problem that we think it's going to be. Certainly file the Library of Congress. You, If you file and it's your address and you're the one to file it there, then you have a pretty good establishment of like, yes, I'm the person, you know, Selena Smith who filed for this because that's my address, this is my return, whatever, and my, that's my pseudonym, et cetera, without having to put your real name. So. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of the preemptive thought and action that goes into these things are basically a boil down like, well, what if it's good and what if somebody wants to steal it from me? Uh, those are great things to consider, but understand that if it's good and somebody wants to steal it from you, then you are the one in a position of authority unless you've been secretly working with a collaborator who could make a legitimate claim to own more of it than you do. Uh, so if that's the case, all you need to have is what you personally, and maybe your attorney, if you feel like getting expert advice, perceives to be a, a, a preponderance of evidence that this is your work. So that could be everything from turning on a GoPro and be like, hi, I'm typing my book. It's going to be called this. I'm going to write it under the name so-and-so. Here it is. I'm going to put this in a safe place. It could be, and here I am, a video footage of me putting a manuscript, mailing it to myself to a secure address uh, in an unopened envelope and all that stuff. The point is, none of this matters unless somebody claims that they're the ones who created the work and not you, in which case, just create as much evidence as it takes to make you feel comfortable that there will be no question about it. So re realistically, if you are writing a book and you are posting it in the place where people buy and read books, which would be Amazon, the, the Kindle ecosystem, you are creating an account of, for your pseudonym that pays out to you. You still control that account. Would that not be sufficient proof to prove that you're the person that uploaded the book, that it's your well, when you get the sufficient proof is going to be up to a judge or a jury to decide. Uh, what would would it seem reasonable and more than you know like likely? Yeah, and I'm not aware of copyright cases have gone very far where you know the minimal threshold of you know copyright has been. You know, I, I, I'm not aware of anybody taking it past the point of like 
yeah, no, here's my Word document. This is dated here. I put this on the Kindle store here. Or I sent this Library of Congress where it gets fought beyond that. I'm not aware of that. I mean, and frankly, it's like uh, I don't know what, you know, works have ever really, you know, get that contested. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think but what we're saying first and foremost is do not let questions like this uh, get in the way of creativity, right? Like, like make sure that you are – Focusing on the production of what you want to do, uh, the, the the pen name stuff will, you know, is is at least in all likelihood very academic. Like yeah. you will be able to prove that you are this person because, especially now, just to publish it, you're just creating a lot of data trails that are like just there. You're you're in control of it. You can show, hey, look, this is the email that I got to my email address on when I submitted it to the store on the date that it was publicly listed. So, uh, cool. If and, you, and, and, anybody else has that, then let me know. In, in the case of like Google Docs, you could go back like, these are the time codes and all of the modifications and all of the edits I made going back over the six months that it took me to create this thing. Uh, uh, here's the account. That's fairly uh, compelling evidence. Not to mention, you know, if you're doing this on you know, self-published on Amazon, the fact that you have this tied to your own bank accounts, tied to any other, like, there are a lot of, 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 of concrete ways that you have to have stuff go to your person, maybe not necessarily your real name, that if, that feels like it would be a pretty clear sign that you are the person yeah. who is the right owner. You're, it's, it's, things do get stolen, but it's exceptionally rare, and in, let's say something does happen. Let's say you know you, you you've written the next great you know robot love romance book, um, and one if you put it up on Amazon first, you're first there. It's hard for someone to copy it because you you know Amazon has copyright protection measures. Let's say you write it, but you haven't submitted it anywhere, but you let people read it, and somebody takes it from you, or you were giving it out to people to read, and somebody wants to take it, put their name on it, and go publish it. Um, you know, if it's a clear case like that. You still have to hire an attorney. You still have to go through things to do this, which um, are expensive, you know. And, and and there is that that threshold. And I've not heard of any cases of that happening where somebody's just outright tried to steal somebody's work like that. I'm sure it has, but in any case, you know, copyright establishing that is one step. But then it's still copyrights cost money to defend. They're easy to get. You get them when you create something. You just magically have one just by the act of creation. But defending copyrights are going to be expensive no matter what. Right. And and. You know, it, it sounds like what what the the writer is more concerned about is having her real name out there or yeah. tied, and and possibly any any you know if someone else has that name, any any undue attention that might come from having that name being tied to stuff. And I think you know that that protection with a pen name is is certainly going to be worth uh, uh, more than whatever hassle would be if someone decided to steal this work under the assumption that it's a pen name like like mm -hmm. there the it the, the 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 cons definitely are outweighed by the pros yeah yeah so file your copyright use your pen name on there there's the way if you don't want to put your real name there don't do it and then you know i wouldn't stress out you know again things could happen but it just it's more of a first time author thing we worry about about that because we've we've invested all this time and energy in it and our fear is that somebody's going to try to take this from us yeah. i think i saw a reddit headline saying that joe hill stephen king's son managed to publish for 10 years before anybody found out that he was stephen king's son so it may be a situation where it's important to this author that they be established under under their own name uh so i don't know it, it could certainly be done yeah. 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 And of course, once somebody knows who you are, you know, that'll be out there, though. You know, the Internet, you know. Yeah. That Internet yeah. is so. mucking things up. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So I want to this was a story I had for weird things, but I think it's kind of could be kind of a after things to thing too. just. You know, playing around with like the uh, the I got the Oculus Quest, which we talked about in the other show, and I love it. And I started thinking like, man, it'd be cool to like it has a built-in microphone, right? And I'm like, man, how would we record a podcast inside of virtual reality? How would we record a podcast? Well, I guess the question would be, what are we creating a 
is it our way of doing the visual? Like, are, are, are we, like, in essence, recording our video component by way of, of VR? Well, we could do scenarios, you know, imagine being able to do stuff where we talk about things and as we talk about them, they happen, kind of animated sort of stuff. You know, if we're talking about goblins, goblins are there or what have you. Um, and uh, this is this is this VR chat. So um, this is this is a, a, a viral series of videos from a Searmore on, on YouTube where he goes and talks to people in VR chat. And I guess maybe because of, of having, you know, an avatar, uh, you get people to really open up. This is a kid in VR chat talks about being bullied. Uh, and, and he's got uh, they've got multiple of, of, of these sorts of, of types mm -hmm. of videos. But um, this this you know with the with the hand controllers and and the little avatars it seems like i mean this the, you know these videos are are uh have gotten a lot of attention over the past few few months there's also i i believe there was a news story last week ta uh maybe it was a reddit thread but somebody had done some homegrown full body uh interpolation stuff where basically he combined it with the vive knuckles controllers to give a fairly believable uh, full-bodied avatar um, just with off-the-shelf Vive and Knuckles equipment. Well, there's there's a new development too, which is uh, machine learning to animate photos. And Facebook, I think we showed before, was doing a really good job of creating avatars. So we're getting to the point where just using maybe some past video of somebody and voice, you're able to you create a pretty realistic 3D avatar in there. And of course, I think the fun part is to do it, make it more cartoony or something. Because, but it would be so much fun to do, I think you know, almost like a cartoon like thing. Now here we're watching a video of they take um, just a few photos of a person and they're able to map this person and have this person talking. And it's pretty incredible. They've shown examples. It's using one photo, and it's incredibly realistic. And they take the Mona Lisa, and they animate the Mona Lisa, and she speaks and talks. And this isn't like the the you know the real talk thing where they just try to morph the face onto a 3D model. This is a computer that's looking at the face and trying to understand what are eyes, what are mouth, and how should this behave. Yeah, this is a, a Samsung that I think did this technology, right? This I think uh, that one is, yeah. Yeah. I mean... We got to be what five, ten years from being able to strap on a, a a full resolution headset and feel like we're seeing literally any person we want saying literally anything they want. Yeah, yeah. And the thing about some of this, like, I think a big, big first step is going to be animation. Is that we saw the we saw the system that was able to like fake Flintstones animation sequences or photos, and I think we're going to get soon. I think, you know, you're going to get, you know, your ability to interpolate frames is fantastic. So I think we're going to start seeing a lot more animated content now done this way. And I could see them uh, marketing it as something innocuous, like a, a virtual makeup or something where it's like, hey, a lot of these actors, it takes hours for them to be in makeup. Uh, now they could just show right up on the job and just get cleaned mm -hmm. up digitally. Um, wow. We're looking at the Mona Lisa talk right now. And she's a bit sassier than I had expected. Yeah. yeah, right. There's something about smile, seeing, guys. About seeing her at a even just a slightly different angle that feels very surreal because yeah. it's such a, a you know, world renowned just, image. I, well, yeah, it just makes you like the Mona Lisa kind of seems iconic. It, 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 it's unnatural in that it's so iconic, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then you see it move and you're like, oh, wait, that's just like a lady. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's not the lazy lady frozen in time for half a millennia. That's just a lady. I've seen ladies talk my whole life. This is crazy. <laughs> That's uh, she probably has a favorite cannoli. That's not the same cannoli I like. Ah, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, let me get back to my cannoli vlog. <laughs> so uh, J C Calhoun points out there's somebody who does a podcast inside of like a video game and. You know, we get form of that, like with Twitch and, you know, game live streaming. We're getting, we're, you know, we're, we're getting there. And I'm just sort of thinking about the idea of almost software or something that's sort of dedicated to that end. Yeah. I, mean, I think, I think uh, uh, VR chat has been its own very interesting platform to watch because I think that that, that is the, the seeds of where we would be going with uh, a more production focused, uh, a, produ a more production focused version of, communicating with each other in in a virtual world because uh it's uh 
I mean, the, the, the possibilities are, are really exciting. So yeah. to bring it back to an after things topic, uh, do we feel like this is an emerging market that we feel like uh, somebody should be first to establish dominance in? Because uh, may I remind you, there was a time that uh, BB Live Show was among the top shows on uh, Ustream, which uh, ultimately got supplanted by other markets or whatever. But that that's uh, for anybody trying to make it. Um, uh, that's a that's a, a smart play is to be early. Um. Yeah. But, you know, it's like who remembers Rocket Boom? Sure. I, I know. Do. What, what is Rocket Boom? Uh, it was yeah. uh, it was a news thing. It was like a daily uh, YouTube show. Uh, that 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 people would make fun of, but that was before YouTube. Uh, I, I guess it was around. I, I saw it on YouTube on around 2005. Uh, yeah, it started in 2004, and I guess that was the thing. Is like they were kind of ahead of the curve, but the cost and all that to do it, and then a couple years later, YouTube comes out, and all of a sudden, it's like, boom, you know, a flood. You know. Well, because you know there was that time when YouTube came around that everybody, well, not everybody, but people that were like, oh, we're gonna create our own video content this is a competing platform we certainly cannot help it succeed we need to drive people to our site i wouldn't know of a single company i worked for that had that uh, opinion yeah yeah i remember when yeah i don't i don't i i think certainly investing a lot of time in a platform you believe in is worthwhile you know of course maybe not you know some of the other fly-by-night ones we've seen before yes yeah like, uh, you know the the eight second video ones and things like that. You know, <laughs> actually, I think I think Vine was really on a trajectory to crush it, and I, I, I to, the, to for the life of me, I can't understand why. Uh, like what two three years after Twitter crushed Vine, uh, my eleven year old still is quoting vines that she's seeing on YouTube because they've been archived and, and collected on that platform. I, th I think Vine was on, and, and now we're seeing TikTok, what, which was a lip syncing app for yeah, kids. Physically. And yeah. then, and then now they're like, well, we can be Vine. That's fine. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I do think that there's probably a, a really good long form article about kind of the death of Vine and, and uh, you know, where that kind of went. But that being said, uh, you know, uh, if we're going to put that in the catalog of strong decision making from uh, the clear focus of Twitter leadership, then it kind of makes more sense. Well, I, I, I wonder, like with with difference between TikTok and Vine was it was like six seconds just wasn't enough. That was like there was something about the idea of short, but that six seconds felt like it was just too short, you know. Well, and and uh you saw this with Instagram, but also also TikTok is is both of those services have built upon the yeah. short form format that Vine did, but also added, you know, on TikTok, you can do 15 second or one minute videos, right? Instagram, you can do very long videos or IGTV live streaming. TikTok has live streaming stories like it's it's building upon that feature set um, and not just being, you know, in the same way that Twitter for so long was stuck in 140 and even now feels stuck in 280. Um, it, all the other services blossomed because they broke out of those constraints. Yeah, that, 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 look, uh, Instagram stories is a better version of Snapchat. Snapchat uh, was not able to evolve uh, on uh, and add the features that Instagram stories were. They were they were too stuck in this idea that they that they were special because of their uh, idiosyncrasies. So Vine, uh, you know, Twitter didn't see a future in, so they shuttered it and musically realized that, OK, well, we can add these things that we can break through these pain points uh, and, and make this a bigger platform. To me, I always I look at Snapchat and Vine as products that are similar to Facebook before they realized that the news feed was the future when everything was siloed and page centric, then they had a popular service. They added the networking, and now they had something that was sustainable that would be a forever generator of content. And uh, both of those, both Snapchat and, and Vine, I look at as like they were never really able to find their newsfeed. They were never able to find that thing that made it uh, bigger and better and, and continued to evolve. Well, I, I was excited about Vine when it first launched, but as I was thinking like, oh, if they put this thing up to a minute, I could see – useful minute like content you know i could think that you could do a movie review a book review you could do a lot of stuff inside of a minute 
um, that would seem to be like for my arbitrary number, I thought would have been a cool length of chosen. But yeah, and that's what Instagram Instagram landed on a minute. Like, yeah. and then post minute they have, or, or more than a minute they have IGTV, which is God knows how that even works. Yeah. yeah. Want to jump into picks? Yeah, I got a pick. So, we watched in Italy only very few things that were new in America. We watched Game of Thrones, got a VPN so we could watch Game of Thrones. But then we watched something that was being buzzed about very heavily, and I'm so thrilled that we watched it. It is the unauthorized Bash Brothers story hmm. by The Lonely Island. Uh, it is exceptional. 30 minutes uh, and not a moment wasted. Uh, just out of nowhere, the Lonely Island drop a new album, all concepted based on the 1980s uh, or 90s uh, tandem of Jose Canseco and Mark McGuire, the uh, sluggers for the Oakland Athletics. If you have no idea about baseball, it's you're not going to miss much. It's bizarre and ridiculous. Uh, uh, but if you uh, the the one primer, if you know nothing of these guys going into it, is that they both were using anabolic steroids, uh, and eventually it it became a gigantic scandal. Uh, man, I have no clue, no earthly idea how they were able to get the blessing of Major League Baseball to use the logos and footage <laughs> that they use because it's not a flattering portrait of these two real life people. And granted it's cartoonish and it's ridiculous and it's heightened to an unrealistic degree, but the famously prudish major league baseball, uh, uh, allowing them to use copyrighted names and stuff is just amazing. I mean, uh, one, remember when I talked about the Jeff Bezos announcement being something like we're in a post singularity age and that was made for me yeah i watched this and i'm like they made this for justin yeah <laughs> so good it's so good i'm like down, down, down to the drone footage of like my neighborhood <laughs> uh, uh it's it's uh oh god it's so 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 funny and and the raps man they're really good at raps the lonely island they're, it's they're... well done um yeah did they did they have to get permission from LB because it's clearly parody? They they thank them. I I I went and looked. I tried to look up anything I could on it uh, afterwards. So they thank MLB and uh, ESPN and NBC for the footage of the games that they show, the the real life footage of the games mm -hmm. they show. Um, and they certainly are you know using copyrighted uh. You know names. I mean, I guess it's it's less of a would it fall under parody and more of a does it you know get picked up the way that it does if they don't have the blessing. But uh, what, however it is, man, they certainly don't pull any punches because they're using the athletics logo because there's a lot of just like out and out uh, conversations about anabolic steroids yeah. and, and roid rage and. Uh, considering how bizarre of a person Jose Canseco is, it was not surprising to me that he tweeted out how much he enjoyed it. I don't think that Mark McGuire has an official comment on it yet, but uh, if if you have liked any of the Lonely Island stuff on SNL or, or anything else, it's well worth a watch. It's only 30 minutes, and it's amazing. Yeah. Hells yeah. I, I, I only follow that whole thing peripherally and i enjoyed it thoroughly thoroughly it's, it's just i mean I, it's just one of those things where they've never done anything with like real people before on that level or at least that i could think of uh or, or that weren't like friends of theirs where they're or making fun of famous people or something like that but these are like it's a fairly niche thing and they're like ridiculous like in terms of like, describing the, the side effects of steroids and just talking openly about how many steroids there are. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I got a pick. Uh, it's anything by Andrew Heaton. You guys have probably heard either Justin or I show up on something's off with Andrew Heaton. Uh, guess what? They just dropped a new video over at reason.com and it is a surprisingly even handed, 
parody of the current field. Uh, I, I think that whether you're on the right side or the left side, you'll find it very, very funny. The 2020 presidential candidate blowout uh, sketch. Um, they're just funny. He's funny and, and, and his partner's funny. And uh, just go watch everything Andrew Heat never does. Uh, yeah, I'll be on his show tomorrow talking about my uh, theory that Kim Kardashian is going to run for president. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I got a pick. Uh, I finished this while we were doing banked episodes. I was I was kind of stuck on the last two episodes, and I finished it uh, since then, and I'm very glad that I did uh, because I was worried it would get, like, uh, binge, f- binge fade, right? Uh, but... It is uh, Who Lose the Act. I finished the act. This is the story about uh, Gypsy. Uh, uh, oh, my goodness. I don't remember the last name. Uh, about the young girl who uh, whose mother uh, is, is doing Munchausen by proxy, by, mm. by doing these frauds and, and telling the daughter that she's sick. She, she's, she's telling her she's the wrong age, that she's, you know, only 16 when she's actually 20. And uh, uh, it's a, a real-life uh, dramatization of, of the real-life murder that uh, she and, and a boy that she meets online uh, commit against the mother. It is it is fantastic, and I think the final episodes do a very good job of 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 putting into context. Like the first five or six episodes, it's very strong of like the, what the mother is doing is awful and unconscionable, and you see you know the them putting a food a, a feeding tube in. You see her you know you got to shave your head because you've got cancer, but she's not taking you know, radiology, uh, you know, drugging her, lying to neighbors, lying to the government and, uh, lying to doctors. Um, Jeez. and so it's a comedy romp. It, it, it is, it is incredibly, uh, difficult to watch if you're not ready for it. But on the flip side, the final two episodes, final two or three episodes, uh, lay out and really remind you, Hey, Murder is wrong, everybody. You, what you did and what you and that boy did is not maybe the best way to have done it. Um, and uh, it's 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 very good, and it's it's nice and short. It's like eight episodes or something. Um, and Patricia Arquette is great as the mother. Uh, it, it's it's a fantastic series. It's on Hulu. It's the act. Uh, I have a. Uh... One, I think a follow-up I mentioned before, I think, was Chernobyl. If you haven't been watching that, check ch- Chernobyl. Check I, Chernobyl. I, to be honest, I've been hesitant to give it a try because I know that there was so, so many of the numbers were blown out of proportion at the time of Chernobyl that I was afraid that it was going to be a blown out of proportion thing. Like, like if you say to watch it, I'll watch it because uh, I, I think you know what I don't want to do is sit there arms crossed saying, that's not how it went. Um, I don't know how it went. I read a lot of accounts of what happened. And, and, and I know that, you know, we had on one side, you had the Soviets eager to downplay. The other side, you had anti-nuclear groups eager to exaggerate and say it was way worse or whatever. And I don't, I don't know where the truth is on that. And I'm not quite sure anybody really knows. And it, and it's frustrating because, you know, I was just reading, you know, I got an article about something else where they talked about a death count for some event that happened in the United States. And it was like, no, that's the most extreme death count. Nobody think it happened that much. But they just flat out stated that number because it made for a more sensational headline. Chernobyl is a very good example, I think, of the, you know, the, the problems of the Soviet society of that. You know, we don't want to self-criticize if we have problems. Our goal is to to you see a very clear example of. Hey, we have a problem. Well, we can't have a big problem because it'll be a problematic for us. So we'll just say it's smaller than it is. Hey, it's much bigger than it is. No, we can't say that it's bigger than it is. And, and you just see part of the reason why the, the Soviet you know, empire collapsed was just the lying to itself, which mm. not to say that, you know, and, and that's a problem with any any culture. If we have that our own problem, if we don't want to face our own problems, you know, we, we face the consequence of that. There's country not been naming that's facing a very big anniversary soon a 30 year anniversary and nobody inside there knows what that anniversary is because they pretty much shut down the internet whenever it happens and so i think it's a very good example of you know what happens with lack of transparency so mm-hmm. and the detail on it's really really good so but if you want something different do you like vampires 
Oh my gosh, are you about to say what I think you're about to say? Not even remotely. A million, never in a million years are you going to guess what I'm about to say. I swear to God, it, if it's, I want to remain friends, so I'm hoping you're about to recommend the TV version of what we do in the shadows. No, no, not. I haven't seen it yet. I'm sure if I saw it, I'd say this. No, I was going to recommend an audio book called Necroscope, Brian. I'm sorry, our friendship's over. You decided this. Seems like wow. a very weird bar to really, upset, Brian. Yeah, you really, you really pushed all your chips in on the wrong hand there, Brian. Yeah, now you're going to hog on uh, Brian on sinks out of frame. Is this uh, the podcast? I think the podcast is done. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Necroscope is a by Brian Lumley. It's a series of books. I think like six or seven of them on Audible. And Brian, you might like this if you're looking for like really cool horror sci-fi stuff. And it's. Uh, a bit drawn out, but really detailed. It takes place in the 1980s, and it's a guy who can talk to the dead. And one of the things he's trying to do is stop this Soviet uh, vampire. <laughs> you know, just, just right. Bear with me, folks. It really, it's, it's, it's enjoyable. So, and what we do in shadows, a TV show. It's amazing. It sure is. Down tones. <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch it. It's it's pretty great. I I will vouch for the TV show. I think you guys are gonna love it. I believe I loved the the loved loved the movie. So, yeah, you know, cool. cool. Is that it? I think that's it. We did it. it. All right. We aftered all the things. It's been after. There we go. That's the show. We did it. Yeah. How's your back down, Bry? Good. It's fine. <laughs> I got a nice rollout. <laughs> Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you, everybody, for watching the streams today. That's going to do it for us today. Cord Killers was earlier. Check out cordkillers.com and the feeds. It'll be up there sooner than normal. Uh, uh, Justin, you had your stream today, right? You'll be back tomorrow with politics or Jerry? Back uh, tomorrow. Well, you know, I'm actually just hanging out on Twitch now. Hmm. I'm just chatting on Twitch. I'm, I'm recording the uh, podcast offline because, oh. uh, I don't know, I'm switching things up. I want to do the Twitch things on the Twitch, and I want to do the podcast things on the podcast. So. Oh, very cool. Well, check that out. Uh, Andrew, got any Periscopes, any Facebook Lives coming up, any IG Lives? Uh, uh, we'll see. I'm probably going to do something to talk a bit about Audiomatic. Um, <laughs> my... Uh, conversion platform for text and stuff oh yeah you were tweeting out uh, uh some links and some videos right over the weekend about that yeah i'm gonna start doing a uh a beta testing that very cool everybody follow at andrew main for that hell yeah all righty guys thank you so much for watching we'll see you tomorrow bye xo xo xo